Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Simon. Thank you guys for coming. Um, so, yeah, so uh, as Simon said, um, you know, people often talk about the things that they do wrong. Uh, and I write that uh, blog on, on just one lap. And that I sort of use as a, as a sounding board. Um, and the lessons that I learn, I share on that thing. And that's for a couple of reasons. When I started writing that blog, I almost promised myself that I wouldn't position myself as, you know, Mr. Trader extraordinaire who just makes all this money and never gets anything wrong. I'd rather use it as almost a, uh, a very honest reflection of the things that I'm struggling with because I feel that obviously that's, um, you know, other people go through this stuff as well. So, you know, firstly, there are, well, I don't know if the alignment on that is right, but there are, um, there are a lot of things that you do wrong. You know, you lose, you make mistakes, you lose money, you're human. But there are also some things that we do right. So what I'm sort of looking at is the things that I think I'm good at. Uh, so it's not going to be so much a, a lesson on technical analysis, or whatever the case is, but it's just going to be sort of a high level look at some of the things that I think I'm, I'm proficient at and I think that I'm pretty good at. So the way I see it is we have two types of skills uh, when it comes to trading. So there's the technical skills or the practical skills, uh, which include things like, you know, reading the charts, doing technical analysis, identifying opportunities in the market. Uh, finding information is important because if you don't know where to look for the stuff, um, that drives the market, you don't necessarily know uh, what's going on. So finding information, websites, um, you know, people that you interact with, network, that kind of thing is, is a class under practical skills. Uh, and then also sort of the mechanics of trading, entering the stuff, uh, operating the trading platforms, understanding how the central order book of the JSC works or the exchange in which you're trading, uh, what it is you're actually trading. Um, you know, market makers versus DMA and that kind of stuff. That all falls under sort of the practical skills because you have to adjust the way that you do things according to the type of trading that, that you're doing, right? And then the soft skills part is more the mental stuff, right? So uh, these are the skills and disciplines that you need in order to keep your head on your shoulders, not lose your, your composure, um, not completely tilt, which is something that, that happens, you know, relatively regularly and relatively easily. Um, and the decision-making framework that you use. So every decision that we make, uh, and this is something that I'm learning, every decision that we make comes from, uh, you know, we like to think that we remove all emotion when looking at the stock market, but you're working with money, right? There is no way you can remove emotion. So you have to build a framework in which your head works to make these decisions to keep yourself rational so that you can make decisions quickly and, and make sure that you make the right decisions, right? Uh, also, motivation. Uh, why are you doing this? How are you keeping yourself motivated when, when times are tough? And, uh, and learning. And not so much perhaps the ability to learn, but the willingness to learn. I think that that is a, is a very important thing that people don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to. So jumping straight into to practical skills uh, that, we, that we look at. And please, guys, let's make this interactive. If you have questions, ask. Because there's something I'm going to try and explain to you guys a bit later on. And it's can be a little confusing. I tested it on someone once or twice this week, and they've had questions all throughout. So when we get to that part, please ask questions as we go. Um, so in any case, so technical analysis is something that I think I'm pretty good at. I've spent a lot of time studying technical analysis, learning uh, you know, different patterns and how it does, and watching these patterns unfold in the market. So I think that I'm proficient at that. I'm not the best technical analyst in the world by a long shot, but I think that I'm pretty good at it, and I trust my own uh, my own analysis, and I think that's important, right? So to look at what technical analysis is, um, it's basically the study of price behavior, uh, or, or historical price behavior, um, and finding opportunities where the probability of one thing happening over another is higher than 50-50. Okay, so that's how we apply it. Technical analysis is really just the study of turning points and trends, and human behavior, um, because ultimately, Price moves because of decisions people are making, and people are making decisions because of what they believe is cheap or expensive. So that's an emotional sort of thing. So technical analysis is almost quantifying uh, human behavioral uh, patterns in a particular price or in a particular instrument. So and they're, they're interacting with price, right? So uh, in terms of furthering studies in that, you know, there are institutions, people call the Market Technicians Association. They do, uh, you can do a qualification of them called the, the CMT, uh, which is a chartered, chartered market technician. So part of the study is it's a, it's a two or three year course, depending on how long you, you take to do it. And before you can get it, you have to come up with a thesis, 
right? Like any good charter. Uh, you have to come up with a thesis, which they then test. And this, of course, pushes the boundaries of what we understand uh, about technical analysis. People come up with new things uh, and new methods of analyzing data and analyzing market information. And this is, of course, broadening the, exp the, the, the knowledge base that we have about how markets function and how people interact with markets. And this is why learning is very important, right? Um, and as I mentioned, essentially, uh, technical analysis is just uh, the behavior of humans interacting with price. You know, so we're looking at how people make decisions and, and, and why around certain particular price points, okay? Uh, so some key things that I've learned about technical analysis uh, in all the years I've been staring at charts is that it doesn't always work. It's the first point that I have there. It doesn't always work. Um, simply because the example here is, uh, you know, back in the day, technical analysis was this voodoo stuff that people had never heard of. And um, a guy had started at a trading firm in New York and he would draw support and resistance lines. And he'd gone to his boss and he said, look at this price. It was a white maize contract. Uh, it's going to come down to my support line. It's going to stop. It's going to turn. It's going to go up. And the price comes down and it stops there. And it sort of starts bouncing. And his boss you know, doesn't want to be outwitted by this young guy who drew a magic bloody line. And now the market's going to turn. So he picks up the phone and he says, please sell 10,000 bushels at market. And he collapses the price through the level in the ship and the, you know, the, the, the maize price comes down. So what happens there is the technicals work, but not always because they work because people interact. It takes one guy to panic with enough size and your, form, and your, your, your formation is invalid. Uh, and then you know, other people who are, are then trading on that same pattern see that it's failed. They then pile in and then you have these massive blowouts, which is why from time to time the, the patterns fail. So they don't always work because... Ultimately, uh, you know, people are making the decisions for different reasons. Um, it can, however, provide a very reliable base for you to create a strategy or to make decisions around why get you getting in and out of, of trades. Oh, that is a good question. Um, I think more human behavior than algorithmic behavior. Um, yeah, I tell you why. Because algorithms are a lot shorter term in the market than what humans are, right? So. So take, for example, the guy working at uh, you know, a big institutional bank. He gets a phone call from his institutional client, Coronation, Alan Gray, whoever, a big fund. All right? And they say, please sell me 1 million MTNs today. Now, 10 years ago, there were 30 guys at that trading desk, and it would be one guy's job to trade MTN. And he'd maybe net it off for someone else or whatever the case is, and he'd work that order manually as a person for, throughout the course of the day. Now... There are three people at that desk. So he goes, um, algorithm, yeah, VWAP algo, this one, I want to be every fifth trade. I want to be closest to VWAP as possible. Da -da -da -da, million shares in the next, how many? You want four hours. Okay, four hours, go. Bang. Puts the algo on and it goes. And that just pushes the price. And that's how day traders make money, essentially. But how to... Oh, our market a lot, eh? Absolutely. There's yeah. tons of algorithms yeah. in our market. On the, on the more liquid markets, technical analysis works a lot better. Uh, so on the, on the London exchange, um, because there's just so many more participants. Um, our market, it, it's with, it, it has a slightly higher failure rate. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, technicals do still, do still work, I think. Um, but we'll get there. Longer term time frames, right? Not, in the five, not on the five minute charts. It's chaos. Uh, but on the daily charts, sure. Um, so we'll get there. So... I've also feel that you've got to spend a lot of time studying the stuff and you've got to look at it and you've got to keep sort of learning. Knowing just a handful of patterns, you know, is not really enough. You know, you can spot a bull flag. Cool. That's not going to get you a home run every time. You know, you need to understand many different types of, of uh, patterns and, and ways that the market play out over time. Um, and you also have to sort of go through, like, see how they play out. So you need a big enough sample size. So if you see a uh, ascending triangle, um, you know, you need to have watched a whole bunch of them play out. When do they fail? How do they fail? What do they look like when they're about to fail? And once you've seen that a whole bunch of times, you can start learning when to trust and when not to trust the, the particular pattern. Um, and even so, it's not always accurate. You don't always necessarily get it right. Um, so the things that I've learned is that technical analysis works a lot better over longer term time frames. Okay, so if you are trading a five minute inverse head and shoulders or five minute, uh, you know, a falling wedge or whatever the case is, the probability of that thing working out versus a longer term time frame uh, on a complex pattern like that is a lot lower. So a longer term time frame will work out 
a lot more reliably than what the shorter term time frames will. Okay, so on the short term time frames, you can use simple uh, trend lines to to help you find entry points or exit points, because that's you're essentially trading momentum in the short term. So on an intraday basis or on a five or thirty minute chart, you're literally just riding the momentum in the market, which you can ride, but that momentum doesn't necessarily last very long. But you can you can sort of capitalize off that. The longer term time frames, the more complex patterns that take weeks or months to create, those are the ones that really uh, work out, you know. Um, so, you know, it takes practice, obviously. Uh, you need to look at the stuff uh, a, a lot of the time. So if you see a new candlestick pattern or a new, uh, uh, you know, you've learned a new technical pattern, a price pattern, whatever the case is, you know, practice the stuff. Go through historic charts. Look where they, look if you can spot them, how they played out. Uh, see if you can see setups like that in the market at the moment. Um, it's, watch them, see how they play out and sort of just see if the stuff is reliable or not, right? Um, and also, the, there's a behavioral theory behind every type of pattern. For example, uh, when the market moves in a head and shoulders, there's sort of a crowd mentality. It's people interacting with each other. So there's a theory behind what creates that pattern, uh, what type of, you know, what is the driver behind that pattern, what people are thinking or feeling about that stock or the index, or whatever it is. So read up on what that theory is, because once you know what the behavioral sort of theory behind that particular pattern emerging is, then you've got a better understanding of, you know, why it works and why it fails. Um, because, you know, if you see like an inverse head and shoulders, you think, okay, buyers come in, they, sell, they, they buy it up to a level, there's a lot of resistance because there's big selling, the buyers run out, the sellers drive it down, okay, so now you've had this first up, they drive it down, they drive it past the previous low, so now, okay, it's a bear trend again, but the buyers step back and they stack it right back up to the previous level, sellers are still there, they can't get through, the sellers push it down again. Now they can't push it down as far as they did the last time. The buyers come back, they're more aggressive, they break through the level and it runs. So that's sort of, um, that's two forces interacting with each other. It's two opposing views and one has just got more capital behind it and that's why it works. So reading up on those things I've, I've found has been very, very, very helpful to me. So I've got a couple of examples. This is just a random couple of weeks ago trade on the Aussie or not necessarily trades that I took but uh, just price action on the Aussie on a five-minute chart. So we have there just a simple little trend line. So the market sort of gaps up. It's price discovery phase in the morning. Things are a bit crazy. You've got some big moves there. Eventually, we start forming a bit of a trend. Very simple, five-minute chart. You put a little trend line, connect the tops, boom, you get a buy signal, right? Um, so you can then see that there's now a new little trend forming there. So you put your trend line in, and when that cuts, you can either close your position or go short, right? Had you gone short, you probably would have been stopped out because it never really came, but you've now got a resistance level, uh, which then breaks, runs up again, forms a new trend, which again, cuts, you can then swing it the other way, and so on. So it's really just riding the momentum on the short term time frame. You don't necessarily need to do this crazy, insane technical analysis if you're looking at a five minute chart. Um, if you're looking at longer term charts, so here we have copper uh, at the beginning of 2016, this is a, a, what I sort of deem as a, as a complex pattern. This is a, basically a, a, a symmetrical uh, triangle. And we see that this took months, almost an entire year to create. So that to me is a lot more of a reliable pattern. And we can see that thing broke out something amazing. Now the theory behind this pattern is that the distance between sort of the top and the bottom of the triangle when the triangle starts is kind of the projection for the for the target. So that trade worked out wonderfully, and that's in a couple of days, right? And we can see subsequently has just kept going. So this was at a time the market, the technicals were telling us uh, there's a long opportunity, a brewing long opportunity in copper, and everyone thought commodities were dead, right? But the market was telling us consolidation, the range is getting tighter, it's going to blow in, in, in a direction, we don't know which one, it breaks up to the top, and suddenly there's a whole bunch of fundamental reasons why we want to be long commodities. <laughs> so, when it breaks through that blue line, yeah. where would you have bought? So you'd probably try buy on that red candle, or you know, if it gets away with you, you just kind of lift, because you've got your, you got, that's your target, right? So you could buy anywhere sort of in this range. Um, sometimes what would happen is you buy there and it comes back, and I've got an example of something that had happened to me uh, uh, a couple of uh, a couple of weeks, well, a couple of days ago, really weeks, I guess, uh, on on Glencore, that it broke out. The weekly said, you know, 
I need to go in. I went in, it came back, it back tested the, the, the level and is now going again. So, you know, sometimes you're a bit soon and you feel like you're on the wrong side for the first couple of days or whatever, but not, not always. Sometimes you're very lucky that you've just bought and didn't wait for the for the retest because you never get a retest like this, for example. It retested here for like a couple of hours a day and ran, you know. Um, so you sort of have to kind of feel, um, I mean, this was quite a big one and this was already a very strong run. And it's hard when it gets here. It's hard to buy because you think, look at how much it's run already. You know, it's gone bloody 20%. I can't buy it now. But something, you know, follow the market. There is no such thing as cheap or expensive. There is what people will pay for it. And if people are buying it, you better buy it. You can't say, not especially it's too expensive, I'm going to short it. Because people have been saying that since 300, you know, but they keep buying it. So we can't be looking to fight against the forces that are driving the, the market. So in any case, so another thing I think I'm pretty good at is finding high probability setups. Um, there's two types of high probability setups in my in my mind. There's sort of the really extremely high probability setups that are very rare, and then there's the sort of everyday grinders. Okay, so the 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 very high risk rewards one don't come around often. They've got massive risk rewards, one to ten, one to eight, uh, one to twenty, that type of stuff. Uh, so you take them small because if you you don't necessarily you know you, you, there's a very low probability that they're actually going to work, but if they do, uh, it's fantastic. Um, and you know, as I said, they don't come they don't come around very often. And because their price targets are huge, they usually take a lot of time to to work out, right? Um, and in this case, trailing stop losses are very helpful. Yes. So what is trade them small? Trade them small is like say, for example, you use uh, a two percent risk management <laughs> model to raise two percent of capital, risk half a percent. You know, so trade them smaller in the sense that. You know, you're going to be in this trade for a long time, especially if it's on a derivative. You're going to be paying interest on that position for a long time as well. So you don't necessarily want to put a big chunk of exposure on it because you're going to be paying interest for possibly months. Um, so you take it a lot smaller. And also then, you know, you're not so emotionally invested in it, so you can let it run for forever if you're in the money, right? Alternatively, uh, you get stopped out very quickly if it, if it doesn't work out. So I've got an example here actually on Sibanya Gold. So... This is a four-hour chart. Uh, we all saw that the, they had the, you know, the right issue and the still water thing and the share price sort of gap down. So the real trade here is from this little bottom range that it's made uh, over the last couple of weeks to close that gap up at 25. So we've got a setup here on a four-hour chart. We've got a little, uh, a little sort of bull channel, if you want to call it that, or a bull flag. We got the breakout. We got the retest. Uh, and I've put a stop loss here just below the lows so that we can try and take that trade up there. And if we have a good position, then we can run it all the way up to close the gap at 25, which is potentially a massive trade, right? I get stopped out. <laughs> so a four-hour candle closes below my level, stops me out, and bang, it runs and it hits the first target. And if you look now, it's gone all the way there. So here, we risked literally 30 cents to make 90 cents. So it was one to three. And now there was three rand 50 on the table and potentially... A whole lot more, um, but I'm out. You know, so sometimes you get stopped out of these things. Sometimes it works. This is a trade that I'm in at the moment. Um, here I entered uh, just over 35 at around 35.50. Uh, my stop is just below 34. Um, uh, this is Impala. So, and if this thing runs to 65, hey man, I'll, I won't complain. But that's going to take potentially months to to play out. But the risk reward is fantastic. I mean, even now. You've got almost a one to five risk reward on it. When I took it, it was it was about a one to eight. This is a daily chart. Yeah, um, and it's just like a. You know, and this is also you know you can see it's a head and shoulders here that sort of ran almost to target or completed itself and it completes itself in a falling wedge. So that's actually quite a nice setup that I've that I've seen happen in the past. Yes. Yeah. So I'm gonna let it wait. I'm gonna wait a little bit before I put the trailing stop on. Um, but I'm just then going to let it run. Yeah. Um, I've got a position on Glencore as well, which is thankfully in equity because you can't get a CFD on it, so you don't have to pay the interest. Um, right, okay, so then there's the usual sort of high probability setups, which is really the kind of thing you want to trade, but with a more regular um, risk reward. So, I mean, this is a massive one. If that works out, it's huge. But uh, the sort of more everyday trades that come around, yes. Yeah, I don't know. It's very... Yeah. 
Oh, you mean like a like a trend line that's tested, tested, tested. Sometimes it breaks out and sometimes it retests because sometimes it can create a false breakout. And then sucks you in. Yeah, look, that happens. Um, What's your principle? Do you wait for retest? No, I'm more of, more often than not, I just take. Eh? Yeah, more often than not, I just take. And if I get stopped out, then I get stopped out. Um, you can wait for the retest. The risk, though, is that you see such a great setup, it breaks out, and it never retests. And then you sit there, and you're going, ah, and you're counting the money you could have made, you know. And um, I'd rather stop out knowing that I at least had a go than not get in. Um, or what you can do uh, is you can take half. And if it, re if it retests, take the other half, or a third, and then two thirds, or whatever the case is. Um, and then if it doesn't retest, then you can, you know, then I've got half a position, but at least you've got some, you know. Um, so yeah, the more usual risk rewards. These also uh, they come around a lot more often than the extreme risk reward trades. Uh, but still, even so, a, re a proper trade doesn't come around very often. Okay, so uh, it takes a couple of weeks. Sometimes you sit. You know, you sit and you watch a couple of things brew, and you maybe take a couple of trades a week or a couple of trades a month. But it's not necessarily like this, you know, constantly five times a day that you that you're taking trades. Um, especially not on CFD. I don't think that's necessarily the wisest thing in the world to do. So, um, and something that I that I like to do is I don't take trades that I don't understand. You know, so if I scan through the market every single day and I look at every single chart and every single stock, I guarantee you I'll find a setup on almost every one of them. Uh, okay, maybe not almost every one of them, but I don't want to take a trade in something I'm not, I don't know what's going on in the stock. I don't know what's going on in the macro environment that drives that stock. You know, you're involved in stocks that you understand. You're involved in stocks that you know what's driving them. That's been working for me because, you know, you, you throw a dart at a, at a board and you see, oh, there's a setup there. Let me buy this stock and you buy it and it turns out it's like a Tongat or something. Okay, ironically, Tongat, I know exactly what's happening there, but it's not very liquid. You know, it moves five percent. You go, oh, shit, that wasn't part of the plan. You know, um, so you try and trade things that you understand. You know, that you know what's happening. Well, that's what I do at least. Um, and you know, key takeaways here is the uh, the simpler patterns work better, almost always. You know, so you come with these crazy. Uh, you know, you've got a especially the Elliott Wave guys. I mean, they love. It's a fifth. Da, 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 pff, whatever, man. It's a rising wedge, <laughs> or, or it's a flat top triangle, or it's a you know consolidation break. That stuff works. The very super complicated stuff is very super complicated for a reason because the one out of ten times you get it right, you get to brag on Twitter how clever you are. Um, did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, say, yes. Could you just explain? I don't understand one to two or one to three or one to five. Right. Or okay. So what we want to do is we want to get into a trade where. Um, we predetermine the risk, okay? So we get into a situation, I'll show you this chart here. So we get into the situation, if this is my stop loss, right? That red line at the bottom, and that green sort of dotted line is my, my stop level. So I've put it here to automate it for, for the sake of it, but the real level is sort of this. And then when it gets around here, I'll watch, and if it gets there, then, you know, if it closes below that level, then I have to close the trade, or if it hits this red line and I'm not watching, then it'll take me out, okay? Um, now, what happens is, I calculate how many shares I need to buy to lose a thousand rand from entry to stop, right? So that's the risk part of the equation. The reward is how many shares times, you know, the 30 rand that I could possibly make. That's the reward. So the one to two is I risk one rand to make two rand, or I make risk one rand to make 10 rand per share, or, you know, whatever the ratio is. So I risk a thousand bucks to make 30 grand, or I make risk uh, well, that's like huge. I mean, one to thirty. I might risk a thousand bucks to to make uh, to make eight grand or whatever the case is. That's the one to two, one to eight, one to five, <laughs> that kind of stuff. What instrument are you trading? This is a CFD. Yeah. CFD. Yeah. So you're taking it right to the very top. Which well, I'm trying. Yeah. yeah. And the very top is way higher. <laughs> Sixty-five. It's been much higher than sixty-five. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna try and ride this out. Look, I mean, it's gonna have resistance levels. There's one. There's one. There's one. I've actually. This is currently where my, my take profit is at this level because this is a lot of resistance. But if it sort of works out, then I'll let it run, you know. Um, that's at least the, the, the plan. It doesn't always work out like that. Sometimes things happen that take you out of the uh, uh, trade a bit sooner. It's actually something I covered in the previous presentation I did when building a strategy. Um, it's on the Simon's website on just one lap, so you can go check it out. Um, certain things that are, that are must-haves to get into the trade and then certain things that are, are that guarantee to get you out. Uh, and things that could 
you know, sort of convince you to get out softly or whatever. So you've got to have exit criteria as well as, as entry criteria. But the plan is definitely to ride it to the top. Um, whether or not that'll happen, you know, time will tell. You're going to have a trailing stop on Yeah, that'll have a trailing stop on. Um, I'll, I'll explain that to you now. Um, so, yeah, less indicators work better. Um, you know, having 50,000 oscillators and Bollinger Bands and this and this and this, you know, only one guy, you only really need one you know, tool to tell the weather, and that's a rock. If it's wet, it's raining. If it's dry, it's not, right? Uh, you don't need to have 50,000 different things all pointing in the same direction, and then the stars must shine, shimmer five times, and, you know, then only can you take the trade. That just overcomplicates the situation. Um, literally, simple, stochastic, or whatever it is that you use uh, that to give you a bit of divergence and a trend line break or whatever your entry signal is, that is, to me, what works best. If I try to now combine a million things, then I get confused and you end up not trading or you get in stuff because the oscillators are right, but the price wasn't, and uh, it's just, it's a mess. Um, and then longer time frames work better. So I've mentioned this before, taking, you know, these trades on five minute charts, it's very noisy. It's very, uh, you know, you're subject to intraday forces, big players coming in, working orders, they don't care about price. They were tapped on the shoulder and said, buy you know, 500,000 first rands in the next half an hour. And this oak is just buying like crazy. And he doesn't care about technicals. you know. And when he's done, he's done. And he's gone. And suddenly the price falls back again. And everyone sits around, whoa, what was that? you know? Um, but on the longer term time frames, those things kind of you know, even out. And they don't, that noise starts to filter out a bit and, and it goes away. And there's obviously no such thing as 100% success rate. You know? these, these things do fail. So... A regular sort of high probability trade, this was Anglo-American PLC. We saw this massive run that it had in 2006, and it ended the year with a head and shoulders pattern, which then played out, and in doing so, made a bit of a falling wedge. Right? So this was a bit of a messy play out. I mean, you'd like to see them fall straight down. They don't necessarily do that. So it sort of plays out all the way. It hits the target of that head and shoulders, and in the process makes a falling wedge then breaks out of that that falling wedge, which is then a buy signal, right? So the trade here was stop was at the lows and the target was there. It ran, it hit the stop, it smashed through it and kept going. But at this point, I'm out because, uh, you know, my setup was only to trade today. Um, so that's a good example. And then here's one a trade that I'm currently in as well, uh, which is Sappy. Uh, it's a nice long uptrend. Um, it's been around for about a year or so. And now we've seen this sort of skewed head and shoulders situation happening here. I think it's busy breaking down. Um, and it's got a sort of a nice one to two and a half uh, risk reward. And we can see there's a couple of levels here where it may uh, find a bit of support or resistance in our case. Well, it is support, but, you know, it's going to be support for the price. We want the price to go down. Um, full target is here all the way at the bottom for that, for that head and shoulders count. So that to me is a decent risk reward trade. And that is something that you can sit in, especially on a CFD, because if you're short, you're earning interest, which is great. Um, and, you know, if you get stopped out, then you lose whatever your predetermined risk was. Um, or, you know, depending on how, you, how you're running it, if you're doing the exposure rule, which is also something I spoke about uh, previously. Um, but nonetheless, it has a stop, it has a target, which is very important. Uh, this is also a trade that I'm currently in, which is uh, Old Mutual. Uh, we sort of see this, what could be considered almost an island reversal. Made an impulse move, uh, came back down, nice little pullback. You can measure that move in it targets up there. Um, it didn't end quite so nicely. I think it ended around there today. Uh, but it's a decent sort of risk reward and something that I can that I can be in. And this trade will probably last a week or so. Uh, and I'll know my fate if either I made a couple of rand or I lost a couple of rand, one of the two. Um, and then this is something I actually pulled a stop on this today. And I think I'm going to regret it. I stopped out on this this morning. This is the rand dollar. Uh, and we see a bit of an inverse head and shoulder situation happening here. At this point, it shot out, and I just took, <laughs> right? Um, uh, because we saw the, the vote of no confidence not going through, and I thought, okay, we've got a news catalyst. Uh, we've got, the, you know, deteriorating sentiment in South Africa. We've got to set up an inverse head and shoulders. It is sort of at the time that I took a trading above the, uh, above the level. It was, you know, almost late at night. The candle was almost closed. I thought, okay, you know, have a go. And, uh, well, I stopped out this morning, so doesn't always work. But it would work. Would have worked nicely. I mean, that's about a one to two and a half or so on the, on the risk reward. So another thing that I think I, I, I can do pretty well is something called multiple time frame analysis. So what you're doing with this essentially is you're starting with longer term <coughs> charts or longer term uh, data, 
and you're working your way into shorter term time frames. So you start with a weekly chart and then you go to a daily chart and then you go to a one hour chart or a four hour chart and you try and find your entries on the shorter term time frames, but you're trading the big picture, right? So you're trading when the, the weekly, the daily and the four hour are all pointing in the same direction, all confirming the same story, then you're taking the trade, okay? Um, so the more confirmation there is, uh, the better for the trade and the higher the probability of it working out. And you trade when, uh, when they're all three. And also, very important note, I suppose, yeah, contrarian setups do work, you know, short and nice bash, but you have to keep a stop loss on those things. Uh, whether it's short and nice bash or whether it's, you know, long rand dollar, whatever the case is, you can pick a turning point, but you have to make sure that when you do those things, your risk is very small and you have to stick to those, to those risk parameters. So this is a Glencore chart, for example. Uh, this is a weekly chart. I think we've got an inverse head and shoulders here on the weekly chart. It broke out. Uh, I waited for this candle close. I bought it in the next week. Uh, just bought it, you know, Monday morning. And um, subsequently, it's now retested on the shorter term time frame. Uh, but as you can see here, this is sort of the, 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 the weekly chart. And if you drill down to the daily, you've got that head and shoulders neckline that breaks out, which is another confirmation. And on the four hour, you've got this trend line that was sort of retested. So that would have been the ultimate perfect entry point. I didn't take it there, I took it there. But you can sort of see there that you've, you're drilling down three different time frames and each of them are saying to you, the thing is going up, the trend is up. And you're then trying to pick perfect timings from there. So what you could have done, for example, on this, is you take, you buy a small portion on the, on the weekly and then when it retests there on the daily, I mean, you had to be a bloody ninja to get it at that price. But if it retests there, you can then, you can then get into it uh, for, with the rest of the volume, you know? Um, so this type of thing I think helps a lot because it makes sure that you never trade against the, the macro trend. You know, a lot of the time you think, oh, there's a long setup. Uh, you go along, but the weekly chart is pointing down, and before you know it, the sellers step in and, and take, you know, take control and sell it all the way down. And you're going, but my setup was for a long, and it was on a one-hour chart. Now I don't understand what's going on. And it's because the bigger picture the, the longer term time frame is driving it in a different direction. Do you never trade against uh, the bigger picture? So you you try not, the, well. The weekly tells you short and your daily tells you long setup. Then you sit in your hands. But then you trade the replacement maybe? Because yeah. the replacement on it weekly. Look, I, yeah, I don't know. I'd look for something else to trade. There's, okay. there's plenty of other things, you know, or you wait a week. See what happens. Um, there's plenty of stuff to trade. And I think what happens to a lot of people, and it happens to me, a lot, uh, and it's something I'm learning to control, is that I don't have to trade every day. I don't have to trade, especially with the day trading thing now. You want to trade the whole day, okay? I know that I can make money between 9 and 9.30 is when I make the most money. 10 o'clock, still there. In that half an hour to one hour, I can make, very quickly I can make easy money because stuff come out of auction at the wrong price and there's price discovery and there's some craziness that happens. And then in that time, I can make cash. From 11 to 2 in the afternoon, I lose money. So what do you do? You stay out. You talk to people. You do research. You answer emails because you have to do those at some point. Um, and you kind of like busy yourself with other things because you know that you're not strong in that situation. When the U.S. opens at 3.30 again, there's a volume. There's liquidity. There's uh, volatility. There's action. So you can then trade then again. Um, so you don't necessarily have to always be in. I think that is uh, like a very important concept to, to, to get. And it, takes, it took me a bloody long time to get it. Eh? Because you feel... I'm trading, I have to work to make money, I have to trade to justify this because I'm staring at this bloody computer for hours. If I'm not trading, I'm not working. And, you know, that's not true. You, you're talking about very short term day trading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, day trading. Um, not even charts. Not even charts. You are looking at the central order book. You're looking at bids and offers coming in, and you're seeing how they're interacting with each other. And I'll show you. I've got you. They do plot charts, tick charts. I'll show you now. now. Um, in my previous presentation, I actually put a uh, an example of what the order book looks like. In this one, I didn't. But um, in the previous one, it's on just one lap. You can you can go have a look there. I go into a bit more sort of detail into that. Um, I think it was the first presentation. Yeah. So it's two years ago. So anyway, so something else I think I'm pretty good at is uh, the trailing stop loss. So this is something that is, a, is, and it's probably still not perfect, but I think I'm starting to get it, okay? So I'm gonna run through this and explain this to you, and then I've got a couple of hand-drawn examples, and this, if you guys understand, please ask, okay? So 
you start with the hard stop loss in accordance with your setup that you have. Okay, so there's a uh, head and shoulders or whatever the case is and your stop should be at this level and that's where you start with your stop loss. When you enter the trade on whichever time frame it is that you take the trade on, be it four hour or one hour or daily or whatever it is, you take note of the average true range. It's an indicator of what the level on that average true range is and you multiply it by two. And that is the distance that your stop loss needs to be away. Now, if your hard stop is not that distance, don't panic because you're not going to put it there immediately. You're going to wait until the trade is that distance in the money. ATR times two at time of entry in the money. And then you put the trailing stop on, which means now you stop out at entry. Okay, so worst case scenario is you lose no money, which is great. Okay, as the market then moves in your favor, that trailing stop loss now ratchets up with the with the stock. This, this example I use is a short actually. So this trailing stop loss, um, you know, ratchets down as time goes on. Every period that passes, let's say it's a one hour chart, every hour the ATR value changes. So the ATR value gets smaller, which means your distance from price to stop gets smaller. So the stop loss is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Then what happens is either the trend turns and it takes you out, okay? or you have a period of consolidation. During that period of consolidation, the stop loss gets even tighter because in the consolidation, the average true range of price over the period is becoming smaller, right? If there's a breakout in the direction, in the opposite direction to what you're pointing, obviously you get taken out. If there's a breakout in your favor and it goes further down or further up if you're long, then ATR will open up again because in that breakout, volatility comes back to the market and the true range that the share is trading in over that time frame that you're looking at now increases, right? But you don't now move your stop higher or further up or further down or whatever the case is. You leave it where it is. You're now back at the hard stop situation where that's your stop loss. You wait until it's gone ATR times two at the time of the breakout in your favor and then you start ratcheting your stop lower again. And then eventually it'll consolidate, stop will tighten, at some point it'll take you out. Okay? Does that make sense? Right, so it depends on the setup. So here is a good example. This was today, it's a one hour chart on Xoro. So uh, we have a bit of an uptrend. Uh, I mean, I didn't, wasn't looking at it here, but it broke the trend, it retested. I mean, you could have gotten short there. Here we have what I think is sort of like a, like a bit of a support level that was being tested. So, and very, very closely, if you look there, there's a sharp move down, there's a bit of a, a bear flag and another sharp move down. So breaking this fancy schmancy pink line I've got over here uh, would be a short entry, right? So your hard stop here for this would be somewhere above this level. Now, it's ironic that the ATR at the time here is 86 cents, I think it was, 86 cents. So 86 cents times two is one rand 72, uh, and that would put your stop loss literally there, okay? What is your ATR period? Uh, ATR is the period of the chart. So I just use the standard ATR. I think it's 14. I think it's 14, yeah. So it's, it takes the average of 14 periods, yeah. Um, so that sort of works out. Uh, and also, you know, that's also something I learned. People come with like, oh, you've got to set your stochastic to this, and you've got to do that to this, and all these custom, stuff. you know, the guys who developed this stuff studied it for years. Leave the standards. I leave the standards because you know you start changing. You know you start messing with it. Your stochastic looks different to someone else's. Everyone's confused. Nobody knows what's going on. It's yeah. I just leave the stuff stock standard. Um, but that's me. You know, other people swear by their custom indicators, and uh, you know they'll fight me to the death for it. So it really depends on the person. Um, but in any case, so here now you could then ratchet your trailing stop down. So because this hasn't happened yet. I've got a fancy squiggly line that I drew that we can use as an example. So there's a little uptrend. Uh, the little trend is broken, and I've tried to emulate that chart as close as I could. Um, and we've got our hard, we've got our our hard stop level, right? So in this case, what we've what I've done is I've worked out ATR is at 86 cents. So ATR times two is one rand 72. My stop loss is one rand 72. If I look at the chart here, that is actually quite a good stop level because it's a previous uh, resistance level. Uh, it was resistance sort of there. And it's or support there, and it's become resistance there. So it's a decentish kind of level. I think that it's it leads to a, a, a probabilistic outcome. Um, and we've got a stop loss. So we enter the, uh, the we enter the trade short at 108.08, .08, and the stop loss would be 109.80. Uh, 
right? So this is, I didn't actually do this trade. This is just an example. I had to find an example. So I found a one hour chart today and I, this is what one would do. This is what you could do with, um, with Imperial. Yes. So initially you took 2080R as a hard stop mm. and then you're waiting for it to double down and then you said this as, as a trading stop. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here is now my entry point. So now the price moves all the way down to there, right? Now that distance is the same as my original stop distance. So I move my stop to that red line, which is my entry point. Okay. Now I can allow the market to run and this level will drag down all the way. That ATR will now drag down all the way until eventually we have a trend change scenario and it takes me out. Right. So, and the, my ATR is still 172. I'm assuming it doesn't change in this scenario, but in reality it will. Do you, do you then every hour go and check your ATR and change the Look, I mean, you sleep at some point, so you leave it <laughs> when you go to bed. But, um, but yeah, like ideally you'd want to check it, uh, you know, so that's why I trade local stocks, not Forex. <laughs> so you can sleep. It helps. So um, is, is that a notional stock point or do you actually put it an order to sell at that point? So no, it's a, um, so the platform that I trade off, you can say points away, trailing stop from points away. And as the market then moves down, it will drag it down. If the market moves back, the stop will stay in place. If the market then drags down and it breaches the maximum number of points that my stop is, it'll drag my thing down again. And then when the hour candle changes, I then need to see, okay, ATR is now this. It's now smaller than what it was before, so I reduce the points away number and it process starts again. Um, so yeah, and then if we have a situation where, so this, this point is now this point. Right over here. So that was our entry. We stopped out. We, we tra tra trail stopping down. In this case, it doesn't turn up and take us out. It keeps going lower and lower and lower until we have a situation where we've got this tight consolidation. So now at this point, our ATR reduces to 45. So ATR times two is is 90 cents. Okay, this is all assumptions. Um, but and now we're in that situation where we've had a period of consolidation. Our ATR is getting really really close to where the where the market is trading. So we're back to that hard stop scenario. If it bounces up, we're out. If it breaks down, ATR will increase again, and we will now have to wait for the market to fall for, far enough for us to start moving our, our, our stop loss down again. So what's going to happen is ATR goes from, from ATR times two goes from 90 to a rand 10 or a rand 20, or whatever the case is, on, the, on this point of breakout. So at the close of that candle, ATR has gone from, from 45 to, to 50. Let's call it a 45 to 60. So times two value is 90 to 120, right? Uh, so we now need for the, wait, to wait for this thing to be around 20 down from where it broke out, and then we start trail stopping it. And we just repeat that process until eventually it takes you out. My question is how do you determine that point? Well, you'll see. I mean, you'll be, there'll be some sort of a consolidation yeah, sure. that's happening there. You'll see like clear support resistance levels and it'll be like it'll be like a whole nother trade setup essentially I mean that's what it'll what it'll look like um, so and that's and that's I think that works quite well especially with those longer term stuff like the impalas and whatever because there you're running an ATR on a daily chart so or Glencore you're running it on a weekly chart because that's the time frame in which you entered the thing so your stop is pretty big so your position is you know relatively speaking small but it gives you the opportunity to run with it as long as it's willing to run. And then if it turns, it takes you out. Sometimes it takes you out too soon. So sometimes you get in a, in a situation where it stops you out. It sort of tests back down, you know, and you think, oh, this thing's dead now. And then two, three days later, it's running again. So in that situation, you feel like a bit of a fool. But, um, you know, more often than not, it saves your life. Well, save mine. <laughs> um, Right, then soft skills. So, uh, I don't know how we're doing for time, but uh, I'm just going to keep going. 14 minutes. 14 minutes left. <laughs> Holy smokes. Okay. Um, right, so soft skills. These are the sort of the mental skills, I think, that are, that are important. That's, that's more comfortable. So, this is the stuff that's all in your head, right? So, a couple of things that I think I do well is I don't overtrade my CFD account. Okay, I've learned that I can handle a certain number of trades open at a time, six to eight uh, Anything more than that, and I have too many balls to juggle, and I can't deal with it, okay? So I need to make sure that I'm never in a situation where I have more trades open than what I know that I can handle, right? Um, and if you have 
10 or 20 open trades, and let's say you use a 2% uh, risk management rule where you risk 2% of your capital and you've got 10 open trades, something goes wrong, and that's 20%, eh? and slippage, plus brokerage. That hurts. So I avoid that at all costs because it's not fun uh, being sort of simultaneously destroyed by 20 trades at a time. I've, I've, I've done that, right? So I make sure that I'm only in a couple of trades and I'm patient with it and I trade the daily charts and, you know, it's not, it's not a race to the top. It's really not. You're not competing against anyone. Um, and I keep sort of the trade smallish so I don't have, and I don't have too many open positions and it's not positions that I've got to go like, <gasps> can't sleep because, yes, yeah, see if this thing rips me tomorrow, I'm going to die kind of thing. You know, it's manageable, reasonable stuff that's big enough for you to make money from but not big enough to bankrupt you if it goes wrong, okay? Um, and it's about risk management. So I use a, a, a mixture between sometimes a 2% rule, sometimes the exposure rule if I'm all long, and then it's, the exposure rule if I'm short, it's usually the 2% rule. Um, I've explained that in my previous presentation, so I encourage you to go have a look. Yeah, you've seen that one. Um, so I encourage you to go have a look at that one. I think that works really well. It's just gearing rules in terms of where we are with respect to the all-time high uh, in the market. Um, and uh, you kind of have to decide which one works best. And, you know, half the stuff I just make up as I go, you know, like there's no, I find that I'm becoming increasingly more um, sort of discretionary than systems based. So I'm not going to take every setup I see. Uh, I'm not going to take every falling wedge. I'm learning how to cherry pick which ones, uh, which ones I want. And there is some sort of a something. So I'm just going to say ignore. Oh, it's not even, oh, what do you know? All right. Um, so, yeah, and I make sure that I can stay in the game. So losing does happen. It is not, uh, it's not a game. It's a stock market. They, they, it's designed to take your money. So what I think I've learned is to not lose my hat. Okay? You must make sure that you protect your capital. It is the number one tool that you have. It is the only tool that you have. So I've learned that when the times are tough, you size down and you stay in the game and you keep trading, but you don't necessarily uh, risk the bloody house every time, you know? So you make sure that it's about survival in the long run. Um, so protecting capital is, uh, is, is the best thing. And then if things go better again, I can, I can start sizing up and getting back to, to regular size. My re-entry into day trading is a good example. Um, you know, you sort of start trading and think, ah, pff, fine, whatever. And then, you know, you're trading with a couple of million bucks and your turnover through the market is, you know, five, 10 million rand a day. And you're thinking, oh, this is easy. And it takes one day that you lose 30 grand. And you go, oh, okay, this is not a game, you know. And it's, so then you start sizing down until I know I can get this done properly and then I can start sizing up again. Because the last thing I want to do is get in a situation where I've got no money left to trade with, right? So I've learned, I've learned to protect myself because I have blown accounts and I don't want to do it again. Um, I think also that I'm mentally tough uh, in the sense that trading is, is very difficult. It's easy. It is easy if you think about it. You sit around in front of your computer, you click your mouse button a bunch of times, you make money. It's the easiest thing in the world. But it is immensely tough on your psyche, on your, on your, on your mind. You doubt yourself. So that ability to, to get up and fight again after I've been destroyed one day or destroyed for a couple of weeks or whatever the case is, to go through that and come back. I think I'm very resilient in that, that I've been through that a bunch of times. And I've learned how to, to really accept that the results that I'm getting is not reflective of me as a person because, you know, it's emotional. It's money. You think you mess up and you, I promise you, you see the look on people's faces. They've had a couple of bad days and that, you know, it, it destroys them. So that ability to say, well, not that ability, just the knowledge of knowing that whatever result I'm getting isn't reflective of me. I am not a bad person because of this. I am not stupid. I'm, it is the result that the market gave me at the time that I stick to my rules or not. That is important. So I think that helps a lot with the, with the, with the stuff. And I've got like a deep passion for it. You know, I really love, uh, really love markets. I love trading. So I think that that sort of, you know, having gone through the thing has made me sort of mentally tough and able to, to survive the difficult times. Um, and also, you know, every trade that you enter, I try and enter it with the expectation to win. So this is like a paradoxical thinking. You've got to be prepared to lose and accept the consequences of getting the trade wrong, aka losing money. But you can't go in expecting to lose money. You've got to go in expecting to win. But you've got to be okay with losing. 
So it's a bit of a paradoxical mind trick that uh, that takes a bit of uh, a bit of time, I think, to to get. But you know, you have to simultaneously hold both beliefs that it's okay to lose, but I'm here to win, right? Um, and I don't let other people sort of uh, influence me. Like, and also, you know, you have to try and trade as if you're square. So if I have five or six or seven trades in a row uh, that are bad, you know, you walk in the next day and you're petrified because I'll give you a real life example. Monday, first day of the month, 27 grand down. Tuesday, 10 grand down. Wednesday, 8 grand down. Thursday, you've got to walk into that office and go, um, I'm here to win. That is tough. Okay? Uh, so at that point, you've got to, in your mind, prepare yourself that I am trading as if yesterday doesn't exist. Didn't happen. I'm in the now moment, and I'm trading the setups and the, the opportunities that are available to me now. And so taking that trade, every trade, as if it is completely unique as it is, and as if you have no P&L before this, is very important. And something that takes a long time, I think, to, or took me a long time to, to get. And I still struggle with it from time to time, I won't lie. Um, so I try not to trade when I'm not in the right mental space. So if you're feeling down and depressed and whatever, then you're not there to win. So don't make decisions. Uh, if you're not capable of making them. Um, also, uh, you know, technicals are cool, but event risk is real. So you can do all the charts in the world, but, um, you know, a politician opens his mouth and the game changes, you know. <laughs> so you've got to be willing to accept that uh, that it's not going to always work. Um, I think I can shake off the impact of, of, of taking a big hit um, or a couple of consecutive hits. Uh, relatively quickly. It takes me a couple of days, but I can recover and carry on and, and, and not uh, not worry too much. And I know that the results that I get are a com is completely a, resu uh, 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 sort of a result of the choices that I have made. I can't blame it on anyone else. I can't say, oh, but the market, oh, but you distracted me, oh, but you know this bloody thing didn't work, or blah, blah, blah. It is my choice. I got in, I got out. My choices. I'm responsible. At the same time, it's not reflective of who I am, but it is my responsibility, right? Uh, also, try and trade in isolation. So I try to do this. I don't uh, necessarily look at other people's charts too much, or I used to a lot, but I try to now not allow other people to influence me because you, you, know, you think, oh, short on, on sappy. And you tell someone, oh, you know, I've gone short on SAPI. This is what I do. And they go, oh, but no, I'm running trucks to SAPI's, uh, you know, plant in, in Durban or in Umschlanga, wherever it is, or I don't even know where it is. Um, and they're running that plant 24 hours a day. You can't short a thing. They're making too much money. Well, okay. But my chart tells me to be short. I trust my analysis. That is noise. I need to block it out. He might be right. And they might be making a lot of money. But right now, the chart isn't telling me that the market knows that. Or... Uh, the chart isn't telling me that that is being priced into the, the thing. The price action is telling me this thing is uncertain and it feels weak, and the chart is telling me there's a short setup which is triggered and I need to be short. So I need to block out of that, uh, that sort of noise. And you get this a lot, especially if you're sharing your charts and ideas on Twitter, people criticize you and stuff. You need to just be able to, this is my analysis, this is my view, uh, and I'm not going to let, um, let other people uh, influence me. And what's also important is people can sort of, you know, they're, they're, they make the same mistakes that we make. They make the same mistakes I make. You know, I make an error in judgment and I lose money. Other people make errors in judgment, they lose money. It doesn't matter. You know, I'm not going to let someone else's judgment error or n lack of judgment error, in, you know, influence me in any way. Um, so I will close the trade, for example, when I feel it is time to close the trade uh, or when my stop criteria is hit. So that's, uh, I think, something that I've, that I've learned. It's just to be... I don't know, hard-headed maybe. <laughs> um, something that I think I keep doing is also to keep learning. Um, I constantly try and make decisions that I get into situations where I am working for knowledge and not necessarily for money. Right. So the more you learn, the more you earn. It's lame. It's true. Um, and I'll keep doing this for as long as I go. You know, as long as I have opportunities to be in situations where I'm around people that know more than me or see things from a different perspective or uh, are more successful than what I am and I can learn from them, I'll take the opportunity and I'll, and I'll go, right? Um, so I want to be in a situation where I learn more about myself, learn more about markets, learn more about analysis, learn more about understanding how things fit together. Uh, it's just about 
continuously learning. The most dangerous attitude in the world, and I promise you I've worked with clients, where you're asking me to read something. You're asking me to learn. I've spent enough time learning. I have so many degrees. Ah, you can't tell me nothing. They don't last. You have to be willing to learn. And the day you stop, the day you think you're on top of it is the day it will kill you. Not, you know, actually kill you, but take your account from you. Um, and it's all in your head. So this is something I'm quite excited about. Recently, I've started working with, um, and something I've wanted to do for a long time. I started working with a, a performance coach, right? Like a, she's an industrial psychologist, actually, organizational psychologist. I don't know, some fancy stuff. And uh, it's tough, actually. So I've only had a couple of sessions now. Um, and I mean, she's digging into stuff like from my past and my childhood and this and that and whatever. And something that, that came out, for example, is I have a very strong problem with authority. Okay? I don't like to be told what to do. I don't think anybody does, right? And if somebody says to you, even if it's in your best interest, you know this, even if it's in your best interest, don't sit on that chair, the leg's broken. <laughs> I'm going to sit on this chair. I'm going to show you because you can't tell me what to do. And you'll bloody lose your foot before you allow someone to tell you what to do. Right? So I've got a very similar thing. Now sometimes it gets difficult to admit that you're wrong. So now I've got to think to myself, am I acting in my own best interest? Or am I rebelling against the authority of the market that's telling me that I'm wrong? You know, so, that, <laughs> so that's what I've got to work on for the next couple of weeks. Especially on the intraday trading stuff because there's no real setups and real, um, like risk management is very, very different. Um, so it's very tough to then sometimes admit that, you, that you're on the wrong side. So anyway, so the, the idea is not to remove emotion from, from trading. It is to understand the emotion that you're going through. And there's different coping mechanisms that you can do. You have to acknowledge, for example, how you're feeling, what caused you to feel that way, you know, how you will feel in a, in a different scenario, and then try and work your way backwards from, from there and try and get back to a point where you're making rational decisions that are in your own best interest. So... Um, yeah, I don't know. I've learned the smartest people aren't necessarily the best traders either. You know, you get guys that are unbelievably well-educated but are the worst traders you've ever seen. Um, and it's, I think that's got to do something with the schooling system that you get taught your entire life. If you work really hard, you're going to make a lot of money and you get to the stock market and you're like a doctor um, and nothing you do is working and you, 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 you know, right? But the market knows better. <laughs> so um, it's all in your head, completely, 100%. It's about your beliefs. Yes? Um, to what extent do you find the mental strategy of training? Uh, I do believe that you have to, that you have to uh, use both uh, in the sense that you could have a very good setup uh, on, a, on a stock, but a fundamental change could change the picture. Um, I try to, for example, if I'm going long in stock, I want to make sure that I'm going long companies that have growing earnings. Um, if I'm going short stock, I want to be sure, not in all circumstances, but uh, I think that technical analysis works, but you can't ignore the macro picture. So if the bigger picture, the fundamentals change, so must your view, right? Um, people will burn me at the stake if I say you must mix the two, but that's true. Yeah. Um, right. And then uh, very briefly, I suppose, because we're running out of time, we're probably over time already. CFD trading versus day trading. So I've started day trading again. Um, the first presentation I did was talking about day trading and what that's sort of all about. Um, and then I'm just comparing that to, to, to uh, CFD trading. So on CFDs, you have predefined risk. Okay, So you put your stop loss at a level. You know exactly if you get it wrong how much money you're going to lose before you lose it. And you know exactly how much you're going to make before you make it. As where with day trading, you're trading order flow. So you are looking at bids and offers in the market. There's a big seller who constantly keeps reloading at 180 Rand. They buy 5,000 shares, he comes back. 5,000 shares, comes back. And he's just reloading, 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 reloading. Eventually, it's bid at 180 Rand and 5 cents, and there's no seller. You buy for your life, because that seller is gone, and the momentum will carry it through. Right? So that is very difficult to predetermine your risk. That guy, you could buy it up now. It goes uh, 180, 30 cents, and you buy 5,000 shares, which is huge, right? And then the seller comes back at 180, and now it's bid at uh, 179.50, and you've now got 80 cents of pain that you've got to get rid of. You know, so it's very difficult to predetermine risk in in that sense. So, um, 
with CFD trading, it's easier to take stop losses because you've predetermined your risk. As where on the on the day trade, you're stuck now with a massive position. You didn't really think it was going to go wrong, and now it's hard for you to accept that. Well, I got to throw four grand in the pit here because I got it wrong. You know, um, so it's not as easy to take to take the stops. Uh, technical analysis uh, is, yeah, is exactly sort of what we were talking about. It gives you an idea. Um, of where you're going, but you also need to just have a view of the macro picture, what's happening in the world around you, what's driving markets, what the market is concerned about, what they're looking out for, NFP numbers, this, that, whatever, and technical analysis, and that's all you really need, and you can carry on from there. Uh, and you can CFD trade quite successfully, I think, based on with, with those things. And you trade rather infrequently. You trade every couple of days or you know, maybe once a day or once a week or whatever the case is. It's not this super active glue to your computer all the time, uh, full-time job, situation. As we were day trading, uh, you know, you take five to five to ten trades, five to thirty trades a day. Uh, I'll show you, I've got a nice example now uh, on not yesterday's uh, 10 cent results, but the previous quarter's 10 cent results um, of the type of frequency that you trade. And then reaction time is vital. If something happens, you've got to be on it. You've got to be prepared. If the numbers come out, you hit first. Okay. Um, so preparation is the name of the game. You've got to know what the market's expecting, know what you're going to do under various circumstances, um, and then you know you're really sort of trading at a, at a professional level. Yes. So when you say trading, what you mean? Is it not you're trading equity, straight equity, straight into the market. You are doing it on margin though, but you're not allowed to hold positions overnight. That's why you can trade the size that you do. So it's like just at extremely low cost. Yeah. So there's no, there's no broker between you and the market. Where do you do that? Uh, institutions, yeah. Storm trading is where I'm doing it from. Yeah. Um, so for example, like I've got Herenia, which is a stockbroking firm. At Storm, I can trade for cheaper than what I can get wholesale stockbroking rates for Herenia. Because there's 60 traders and they all trade massive volume and we go literally from our office to a server that is in the JSC basement and we're trading directly on the exchange. Um, yeah, and there's big volume. So, and there's lots of us, which is cool. Uh, and I'm like a way small trader. Hey, there's guys in there that are massive. Yeah. Um, anyway, so this is Naspash on the previous uh, uh, quarter's um, 10 cent results. So this was around 10.30. Uh, the numbers come out at 11 officially. This yesterday it came out at 11:30, so it caused a bit of panic for me because you're sitting on the edge of your chair for half an hour, and I really needed a wee, and you can't leave. Um, but uh, so the numbers leak on QQ.com. So all the green dots are buys, all the white dots are sells. Okay. So here we have 10:30 to 10:40. That's 10 minutes. All right. So one, two, three, four, five buys, two sells. Okay, then another buy, another sell. So I take five bucks there. Then I look, okay, now buy again because now I want a small position because the numbers leaked and they were good, but nobody knows if they're real, so it sells off. So I get into a spot of trouble. I got to sort of average my way out. Gets up, I get back to slightly above my average. I dump all the stock. And I'm like, okay, but what if it's real? Okay, you know, so there's still momentum. I buy, I scalp five cents or five rands out of it, sorry, um, which is from there to there. And then I get out again and like literally, a couple of seconds later, I'm like, okay, but hang on. If the numbers are real, I want to be in, so let me just take a taste. Boom. So I buy. So now you sit and it slowly starts drifting up, drifting up, and okay, I'm in the money on this position I have. Eventually, the numbers come out. Bang. You, I mean, the number comes out. That move is instantaneous. 27.06 to 27, I think, what did I get there? 27.12, 27.13. It, it evaporates. It's immediate. Okay, so I just buy. The thing runs from there, it runs up, what is that, like 20 bucks, straight line, within two, three minutes, and I managed to get out right at the top. So there, in a space of, I don't know, what is that, 40 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, you did a whole bunch of trades. That is day trading. You can't do that from, you can't do that from charts. You're doing that straight from looking just at the market, um, which is quite a bit of fun. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, um, so yeah, day trading, basically direct access to markets, no layers of brokers between you and the, and the, and the uh, exchange. And it's professional level infrastructure, like the trading platform that I use, for example, costs 3,600 Rand a month uh, to use. Uh, there's a Bloomberg terminal, there's this, there's that. Um, it's really professional level um, 
sort of infrastructure and it's really about speed and frequency so i mean between 9 and 11 in the morning or 9 and 10 in the morning i can take 12 13 trades um and there was a there was one day i did one execution every four and a half minutes boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you know that's that's I've quite no nah, yeah it depends on on who you are and how big your account is and stuff but yeah it would be bigger than what i trade on my cfd account yeah so smaller my day book is bigger than on my cfd account just on line uh, caps that you have like 30 seconds to buy and sell where does that fit in you know um no you probably well uh it's like it's like some sort of program on your, on your cell phone oh uh, you know what yeah. that is those are binaries don't trade those they're the devil those it's are binary options well no so in the day trading firms the guys can game the binaries um because they know what drives the market Right, so what it is is essentially an option that expires in a very short time, time frame, and you're basically taking a call on it's going to end above or below a particular price in five minutes from now. And the risk reward is like one to one or one to 0.8. So if you get it right, you make 0.8 of what you bet, and if you lose, you lose one. So mathematically, there is no way that you can make money unless you get it right like every time. Um, so that's definitely, that's it. In the UK, it's no longer even allowed to do that you'll find IG no longer makes binaries available because it's not even trading. It's spread betting and it's, they're saying it's unethical. So yeah, don't do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, and also, you know, with day trading, you sit in a day trading environment. Um, there's a whole bunch of traders. Everybody pays a desk fee to be there. You pay a percentage of the profit that you make and it's worth the money that you pay because of the, the trading cost is very low and you're around people that are making you know, a proper living from this. They're doing nothing else. They're coming in, they're trading, and that's what they're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very reliant on volume trading through the market. So days like we've had this year where volume is very low through the JSE, uh, it's very frustrating because we need volume and volatility to, to move stocks, and there's just it's being very difficult. Um, every day you start with cash. At the afternoon, you end with cash. You don't hold positions overnight. Uh, otherwise, you must pay for them. And you're trading equity. And if you're sitting with like 300 Nasbars, for example, you've got to fork out quite a bit of bucks at the end of the day to, to hold that position instead of just the margin. You just sell it by the end of the day. Um, so yeah, team trading environment, which is pretty cool. And people celebrate each other's wins. It's a very supportive environment. Uh, there's a couple of guys that we're busy training up. Um, they all had record days yesterday on Nasbars. And everybody stood up and clapped for them. It was amazing. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of kind of what day trading is. I think though, for ninety percent of people, CFD trading is the way to go. Um, going into a day trading firm is the ultimate dream, but the truth is, it, not everybody is suited for it, um, and uh, you know, it takes a long time. So, there's no such thing as a salary in a day trading firm, and it could take you up to two years before you start to make money. So, CFD trading, while you've still got a job or what, a f source of income or whatever it is, and you can trade a bit on the side and you're not dependent on making money from the market is definitely the best way to go. And eventually, at some point, it can maybe turn into, uh, uh, you know, day trading. But I think for, for most people, CFD trading or equity trading is, is probably the way to do it. Um, and yeah, also, just as a fair sort of word of, word of warning, these, uh, these, you know, I have a yacht that's parked in, uh, uh, in the harbor here, and I trade bin binary options. You just pay me 20 grand for a course, and I'll teach you how. That's not true, okay? Um, those guys do, no one has yacht money and sells trading courses, okay? There are courses out there that are credible and worth it, but not trading binary options in Forex, okay? Um, trade the real market, real stuff through the JSC, through a registered broker that's not registered in Cyprus, um, you know, do it properly. And that's it, guys. I'm sorry, Simon, that I went <laughs> over.